to the news. News. We got to get the the papers. We, we're going to get I'm audio get effects some, in here at some, some point. Do, 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 yep, do, do, yep, do, yep. Someday. Something goofy like that. We're working on it. But we had some interesting stuff happen this week. Um, what th- this first story, dude? Okay. Probably the most puzzling right this now. This is really weird because we don't have any information, but it is bizarre nonetheless. Yeah. Like, incredibly weird. How bizarre. So, X-Men 97. I am not overly familiar with X-Men 97. You didn't watch that as a kid? I, I think I caught bits and pieces, but I don't have the, the love for it that a lot of people have. So, this show is coming out, I think, is it the end of this month? It's not out now, right? Not out now. Tonight, tonight was actually like the red carpet premiere. Okay. Okay, so tonight was the day they were running it for, like, critics and whatnot. Uh, but this is so bizarre because the project's debut, uh, uh, on the eve of the, the de- debut at this, like, red carpet event, uh, the writer-producer who worked on also Moon Knight and Blade will no longer be promoting the show or moving forward with the future seasons. This is, We're talking about Bo DeMaio. This is the creator of X-Men 97. He has been uh, fired by Marvel. Uh, He completed writing duties on season two of X-Men 97. He was lining up press and making plans to attend the show's Hollywood premiere tonight. He was discussing even, he was even discussing loose ideas for a third season. He had all this, all this stuff going on. And uh, earlier this week, Marvel and DeMaio decided to part ways. Now when we say part ways, I'm using that loosely because his company email was deactivated immediately. His Instagram which has been like very active for like source material for like a- X Men stuff, completely deleted. Like he has basically gone off the grid complete. This is such a weird development for when this show got announced. My people were like, "Oh fuck yeah, he's an integral part of this show." Right. He's a huge part of Marvel. He's a a, a writing force behind Moon Knight. He's a writing force behind the upcoming Blade movie, and now he is just gone. And Mar and Marvel has said nothing. They haven't responded with a comment. His agency has responded with nothing. There's nothing. And now look, we're only like two or three, three, two or three days into this, but it's just really weird. Yeah. How this happened? Now X Men ninety seven. Tell like tell me what the significance of this and why it's like big. This is coming back, but I mean, how huge is this that the creator is gone? Like well, he's just not there. I mean X Men from growing up in the 90s was like one of the cartoons like you I mean that and like spider-man when it came from like comic book sense of it like i mean it's one of the most iconic like cartoon intros of all time uh you know heavy like character um development storylines like real like adult <laughs> stuff even as kids and things like that just super popular and you know it when it was done it was done and you know everybody f- has always said that like that was like especially during that period of those kind of cartoons like that was one of those ones that was like a benchmark. Like, he, can we ever get back to that sort of thing, right? And, um, you know, to be able to bring that back, you know, because everybody loved yeah. that so much. Like, matter of fact, when Disney Plus dropped, I mean, that was one of the shows that I initially just loaded up to watch a couple episodes right away. Right. You know, I think everybody kind of did that. Just even hear the intro, right? <laughs> um, but, yeah, yeah, because, yeah, yeah, he didn't uh, give the curves that it needed. Um, <laughs> didn't do Rogue right. Justice. Yeah, right, 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 <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, so this coming back like this was huge. I mean, X Men hasn't been around for so long in other media because I think that was before potentially. You no, know, Fox did have it back then. This was Marvel actually having full control of doing X Men right. outside of you know what I mean. The, the first real X Men project they can actually do, right? You know, even if it's an animation, and then you know they make it a sequel to this amazing series. You know, so it, it's a, got a lot of buzz. A lot of people were really excited about it, and all of a sudden, like. He just gone. He like, gone. I like, mean, dude, he has what? disappeared on all so dude, to say he was active on Instagram is an understatement. Like he was constantly posting stuff. Yeah. And he had like 30,000, 30, like 40,000 followers and he just up and de- didn't close it, uh, deleted it. Yeah, I I got to guess that he something did happened. something he got something, he did something really bad. That's I mean, the only or- thing I can I mean this, listen, this is just speculate. This is just like. We have no idea. You, yeah. So this is just me throwing spaghetti but just at the wall. Based on these reactions. And like, yeah, that's not something usually. And there's no like talking about it. Like something, somebody's fucked up somewhere. Yeah. And, and, and like to just all of a sudden like be radio silence. 
That's so, yeah, he did something he wasn't supposed to do. So we'll keep we'll keep an eye on this, but <laughs> oh, that's, dude, I was I was thinking that. That's pretty funny. Cuddle so, says his father Sinbad found him and wanted some money. Dude, he uh, looks like fucking Sinbad. Yeah. Yeah. He looks like Sinbad. Yeah, the animation thing is definitely quizzical. Like I've I've seen pos- I've seen back and forth, like some back then looked better, some now looked better. Mm-hmm. Like I think Gambit in certain ways, but yeah, the animation is definitely a little questionable as well too. And it's it seems on par for Disney because guess what? They couldn't uh they couldn't beat uh, somebody that did less than ten million dollars at the Oscars. So Dude, shout out with uh, without uh let's let's just do it right now. We don't have an Oscar segment. I mean there was some there were some great moments in this year's Oscars, especially Al Pacino's fuck it, I don't care. Oppenheimer. Well, you see what he said about that though? What's that? He said that he, he that they they told him that he had to do that because every uh, and and you know what's funny is I did see that. Uh and and the Oscars came out and said that was the plan the whole time, but he is actually not the first person to do that. Yeah, Tom Hanks did that a couple of years, like I don't know, it was a couple of years, several years ago. He actually did the same thing because it was planned. He walked out, said we had because what happens they announce all the nominees throughout the evening, yeah. so there's no point in kind of going back through all ten movies, which makes sense. It's just the mannerism. And the way that Al Pacino yeah. did it, it's always like, <laughs> he just kind of rolled out of bed and be like, here, I'm here, he and uh, I there. see Oppenheimer, yeah. and we're done here. But, uh, I mean, it's it's also kind of the same Al Pacino we got at the Game Awards. Remember when he showed yeah. up a couple years ago, and everyone was like, like was it last year, wasn't it? It was two years ago. Two years ago. And we're just like, what the fuck is Al Pacino yeah. doing at the Game Awards, bro? It was just really weird. But, like, seriously, uh, going back to what we were talking about, Godzilla minus one. Yep. The stud uh, on a budget of less than fifteen million dollars beat out less than 10. Mission Impossible, beat out uh, Guardians of the Galaxy. I mean, beat out just every major CG movie of the year for best uh, best special effects. Mm-hmm. And dude, like you couldn't ask for a more genuinely excited reaction. From a crew that probably felt like we have no business even being here. Yep. And for them to go out there and get the first dub for Godzilla mm-hmm. in a huge fashion, fucking awesome. But my question is, when the fuck can I buy this movie on digital? Right, we need that. We're taking digital. way too long, Toho. Yeah, make sure when we get it, we get both options, color and black and white. Like, I want those options. And I just want to say this. I saw this today and definitely agree with it. Godzilla, 70 years old now. 70. That just proves that never stop chasing your dreams. Never stop chasing your dreams. So 70 years old, been in how many fucking movies? Right. Cheers to you, go. Hundreds of movies. Cheers. Cheers to you. And finally walks away with some fucking hardware. And now we get <laughs> whatever that movie coming out next, Kong collecting all the infinity stones. I mean, dude, I I I, I I'm not gonna trash that movie because we obviously have to go see it. And and I don't hate what Legendary has done, but I do feel like Godzilla minus one really showed us the different directions that these these studios are taking these these characters. Yeah, like I said, like I've said, like it's weird to watch Toho go from some campy through you know the middle years of yes, you know different things, and then you know now come out with something like you know uh, Shin starting with it. And now I actually watch. I actually finally one. watched that yeah, that's uh, a, about a, about a couple of weeks ago at work. That's actually a that's really a, good fucking movie. Huge social piece, but. Yep. Big, um, big time yeah. social piece. But, uh, uh, you know, and then Legendary starting out in 2014 being real grounded and kind of serious and yep. realistic and then kind of swinging back and getting to be, like, really just... Kind of campy. Little, little, so I'm, I'm here for it either way, but, like, we'll see. Like, I don't think they've done a great job. I mean, the trailers look fun for the new ones, but, I mean, I just feel like the tones are completely different mm-hmm. uh, compared to some... And, and, I mean, I think after you see Godzilla Minus One, you're just like... You can really make this type of movie work with a human element that is impactful. That's a story that you can get behind and relate to in certain ways and still have a fucking hundred foot monster yeah. Yeah. coming through and doing his thing in a way that is absolutely frightening. I mean, I don't see, man, I don't know what Godzilla we're going to get, how Godzilla is going to be in this movie, but I, to, for my money still, Godzilla minus one, that is the most frightening iteration of Godzilla I've ever seen. Yeah, in a long time at least, yeah. I mean, just everything Pretty about it. But no, seriously, kudos to uh, Toho crew for, for getting that Oscar after so many attempts and so many movies, well-deserved. Can't, no, just 
bring the goddamn video out. Bring it on on digital we so I can fucking buy it, it please. Want it. I want to give you all the money. If you bring it on on digital, I'll buy the fucking physical edition as well. It'll probably be a dope ass steel book. Just, just give it, give it to me. Yeah, we're no ready. tone. Yeah, we're ready. This next story, I actually think it's fucking hilarious. Do you think it's hilarious? I'm excited about it, but I think it's fucking hilarious. We now know there will be a Scream 7. Mm-hmm. After months of uncertainty. People dropping out. Melissa Barrera basically getting fucking just thrown off the fucking project. Jenna Ortega. Doing certain nope. comments. Jenna Ortega is just, I'm too fucking busy with Wednesday. I can't be here. You know, the writer and the directors are like, fuck it, I'm out of here. I mean, Scream, by all accounts, was fucking dead. They might as well just done Scary Movie. We thought, we, I mean, by all accounts, dude, the Scream franchise was dead after part six. Mm. Nope. And guess what, dude? Here's what happens. When you drop Melissa Barrea and you drop Jenna Ortega, you got some extra money to work with. Mm. You still have a demand for Scream. Oh, Nev Campbell was pissed. Because she wasn't getting the money she thought she deserved, which she does. But all of a sudden, we got some extra cash laying around. Another zero at the Another end of the Another zero check. on the check. Do a gold old Robert Cookman. Hey, and man, I mean, tell you what, dude. Uh, a year ago, Nev Campbell was like, I don't, I, I just, it wasn't right. The offer wasn't right. Uh, I'm not being compensated enough, which she should be. I mean, she is the face of screen. I mean, other than, well, Ghostface is, but she is. I mean, I mean, Sydney is 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 screen. There's no Wayne's brothers still involved either. There, none. But man, her post on Instagram, she said, "Hi y'all, I'm so excited to announce this news. Sydney Prescott is coming back. Untitled screen. She had the script. She had a picture of the script and everything, uh, written and directed by Kevin Williamson. It's always been such a blast and an honor to get to play Sydney." In the Scream movies, my appreciation for these films and for what they have meant to me has never waned. Even though last year I was like, fuck you guys and your weak ass offer. Wang. But hey, Melissa Bure is not around. Jenna Ortega is not around. But people still want Scream because the last two Scream movies have actually been really good. Mm -hmm. Hey, Nev, we fucked up. And blank check. Right there, you go. Get in there, girl. Just getting in. How's the beer? Hey, man. I'm I'm fucking buzzed. It's flavorful. <laughs> However, I, I I forgot what the letters were. This is the big P. I think it's pumpkin. That's penis. It's uh, <laughs> uh, they're not carbonated. That's the only. That's the only. They're bummer. lightly carbonated. Not carbonated. Uh, I'm using lightly loosely, but they're they're strong. They're good. Yeah, they're, but they're flavorful. But they're flavorful. They're got good flavor. So anyway, circling back, uh, and we'll address, we'll talk about the beers in a moment. But I just want I just want to touch on this. The other interesting thing about this, and I think it's actually really cool, is Kevin Williamson, who wrote the first couple screen movies with Wes Craven at the helm, directing it. He is coming back. He is directing this one. So you've got somebody who's very familiar with the Scream franchise, who is a familiar uh, area of what makes these movies so good. Mm-hmm. You got Nev Campbell coming back. So you got two big cornerstones of yeah. the Scream franchise coming back. You know nothing about this script. This obviously movie is just in the early stages. Uh, we know, uh, the, I think, believe the, the screenwriter's name is Gary Busick, not Gary Busey, uh, is the screenwriter. The uh, screenwriter from the last two movies is not involved. He's currently directing a, a, a movie, the name escapes me. So we have a new screenwriter uh, writing the story. But we do know, like I said, I think it's cool that Nev Campbell's back. I think it's great that Kevin Williamson is involved. He's obviously one of the, the, the fathers of, of Scream. But I just thought it was fucking hilarious how a year or so ago, Nev Campbell was pissed about the compensation, which I'm sure was not enough because that typically is the case. But as soon as all these other people dropped off, they're like, oh, we have a problem. <laughs> we need another Scream movie, but we got enough money. Let's get fucking Nev Campbell board. And she's thrilled. She's so happy again. Good for her. She should be involved, and she should be compensated for it. But I am going to be curious to see how they continue this story tone without the major characters of the last two movies. Because, I mean, that was basically the the storyline we've been following. The two sisters and how that's going to carry forward into this next one, clearly not going to be involved. What kind of – I mean, how are they going to deviate from this? That's 
great question. <laughs> That is the million dollar question. I mean, it's uh, uh, it's. I hope it's good. I hope it's just not some slop that they're gonna hope people will come back to see Nev Campbell. Uh, I mean, and I will because I, I love Nev and I love Sidney Prescott. But it's just like I really like the story that they had going through the last two movies, and we're gonna have to abandon that completely. We're gonna have to, and they're gonna do something stupid like, oh well, those sisters got killed in a car accident. <laughs> right, right, something, right. Something stupid they like that. Someone Louise or something. Yeah, their plane crashed and they died, and uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So the killer needs somebody new to kill. Why not make it? And then Sydney they'll Prescott. be back for the twelfth one because they've made men's and they'll be the killers. Cool. Unbelievable. But no, uh, by all accounts, I'm really excited that Nev yeah. Campbell's back for Scream Seven. We'll see where yeah. it turns out, but uh, I'm a little concerned about the story because I really liked where they were going with the last two. All right, Tom, this next story, something you are very excited about. We are big Ari Aster guys. Yep. We are big Ari Aster fans. Now, look, I have not seen Bo is Afraid yet. I have Sorry. not seen Bo is Afraid, but I still stand by Hereditary and um, God, Midsummer. There you go. See, that's what happens when I start drinking. I forget stuff. I get old. But, dude, Ari Aster won out and just put together himself an Oscar loaded <laughs> class of Jesus actors God. for his next film, Eddington, starring Joaquin Phoenix, Pedro Pascal, Emma Stone, who just won her second Oscar the other night for, for, for poor things, Oscar winner Austin Butler, along with Luke Grimes, uh, Deidre O'Connell, Michael Ward, and Clifton Collins. Uh, dude, now this is, right. I don't even care what the movie's about. I'm going to watch it. Absolutely. And now it's weird. Because this is something of a Western. This is something. This is uh, Eddington. Uh, Astor is directing Eddington from his own script that centers on a small town New Mexico sheriff with lofty aspirations. Two time Oscar nominated cin- cinematographer Darius Kanji will lend the title while that Astor and Lars Knudsen are producing through their company Square Peg. And again, stellar cast. We don't have a release date for this yet. Obviously, a lot of fucking talent behind it. Ari Aster is just continuing to just show that he can create something that people want to be involved in. And there's a sometimes chance where, like, it, people love, like, Bo is Afraid. Bo is Afraid was probably paid, his most divisive piece of work. Right, and I'm somebody who's a fan. So, I mean, that that's what's nice about Ari Aster as well, too. I just I just love the casting here. Pedro Pascal, Fuck Emma Stone, not. I mean, yeah. Joaquin Phoenix, uh, Austin Butler. I mean, you have just talent everywhere. Mm-hmm. And again, Ari's work is very. I think his a lot of his work is cerebral. Absolutely. Um, and there's a lot of ways to interpret his work. And there's gonna be some people that are gonna go into this movie and be like, this "Yeah, is we're being told it's like a, a some form of western, but there's gonna be something in there's there. There's gonna be some kind of psychological element to yep. it." Yep. That's going to require you to think outside the box. Or make you feel uncomfortable. And make you feel very uncomfortable. Yeah, and I'm here for it. That's and the one thing about his movies. Like, whether it's yep. a horror movie or something different, he is going to hit on v- certain themes that are just going to make people uncomfortable in the crowd. I will never forget the first time I saw Joaquin Phoenix, to my knowledge, and that was in Gladiator. And I was like... Space camp, bro. Really? I For me, I was like, when I first saw him in Gladiator, I was like... This guy is a fucking psychopathic creep. Oh, yeah. And ever since then, he's just always, like, whatever he's done, I've just been like, this guy is, like, another world kind of actor. Yeah. Like, just something about him. So anytime I see him attached to something, I'm instantly like, oh, I'm interested. I've loved a lot of his work, man, but for me, still, it's Joker. Um, He was just... Oh, God, yeah. So that's incredible in that movie, like he was just that's so such, good. That's such a great movie. Um, I'm really, I'm, I'll, I'm gonna be really curious to see a trailer for that new one that comes I'm out this year. Excited with him, and Lady Gaga. To, to it's going it. to be a musical of some sorts. So uh, I'm really curious to see how that turns out. Uh, Signs, he was awesome in Signs. He was a great supporting role uh, in Signs. Like I said, I mean, he's just, he's just a very consistent actor, and he always just, he's great in everything mm-hmm. he is. Yeah, so. Yeah. Very excited uh, here. Really excited to check out Eddington whenever that comes out. Obviously, they're just starting production on it, so we're probably a year or two out. Uh, last bit of news, Tom. Oh. I'm really excited about this. Um, I'm going to move over so you can see Skull. Tone is behind oh, it's Giant. Crazy. What the? Uh, Giant Skull is a new gaming studio that was uh, created by a, a Respawn veteran, Stan uh, or Stig Asmussen, 
uh, along with several other people from Respawn, as well as Epic, uh, who worked on Fortnite. Uh, Stig Osmussen worked on both the Star Wars Jedi games, as well as he was the creative director on uh, God of War 3, which is still, in my opinion, one of the best God of War games like today. God of War 3 was fucking incredible. So Stig has shown that he's capable of directing some great, some great games. Uh, but he is the head of the studio. Um, it's a AAA studio called Giant Skull. What Cage movie was he in? Was it Eight Millimeter? Oh, that's right. I think I do think he was in Eight Millimeter. Uh, Joaquin Phoenix. Was he? I think he was in Eight Millimeter. I forgot about that. Man, that's a that's a dark ass fucking movie. Yeah, it is. Uh, I thought it was pretty interesting though. Uh, some of the things that Stig addressed, and and it's and it's kind of relevant to what's going on today. First of all. He addressed like, you know, what it means to him to be like jumping into a new studio. You know, he was very comfortable at Respawn. He said, I really enjoyed my time at Respawn and the Jedi team is incredible. EA was a very supportive company. Come on, EA is a very supportive company. But this opportunity presented itself and there was this itch that as soon as I started thinking about it, I just couldn't shake it. He has to try cream. Uh, the press release announcing Giant Skulls describes their uh, projects. It's building as a gameplay-driven, story-immersed action-adventure game. We know the first one is a single-player, third-person action-adventure game. But here's the uh, here's the, uh, some of the stuff that he said that I think is relevant to today because obviously going on in the gaming industry, we're seeing a lot of studios getting shuttered. We're seeing a lot of layoffs. Yeah. And it's a lot of it ties to how expensive these fucking games are right. to make. You know, and how you have very little room to error, a uh, little room for error. And this is what Stig had to say. He goes, AAA can sometimes mean AAA dollars, but a lot of that depends on how you ramp up your headcount and how quickly the expectations are that you ship the game. Yep. And that can make the game more expensive if you've got a lot of people on a long timeline. That's a very good point. I don't think you need a lot of. Uh, I don't think you need a couple of hundred people to make a triple A game. I don't know how big we're going to get, but especially being able to call our own shots because they're independent, they're not currently tied to like a big time publisher. I think we can make a very successful competitive game with a hundred people. So be reasonable and realistic about the money you're using to. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Don't worry so much about the. I mean, look. I want awesome visuals in the game just as much as the next person, but I need a fucking awesome gameplay loop. And I'm going to go over to Helldivers 2, a game that was $40. Mm -hmm. It's a good-looking game. It's not a fucking incredible-looking game, but the gameplay loop is there, and it's $40, and it's a game that shows, like, you can do a really good game. And Arrowhead game is not a fucking big – it's not a big studio. No. They're a small, independent studio. Um, But, like, it's a democracy. But – um. I'm trying to think here. Oh, yeah. So the opportunity to create something new is exciting part, but launching a new studio. But as uh, they've seen with, like, for example, Immortals of Avium, that's the game that came from that EA original studio. Mm -hmm. And by all accounts, they've had to lay off a bunch of people because it just did not hit the sales that it needed. Uh, and, and also even Callisto Protocol, a game that we were really excited about. A lot of money went into that. There was a lot of hype behind it, but it just didn't resonate well with people. And there is a risk of creating some radical, something that's like radically different than what's successful out there. And this is what Stig had to say. How do we decide we're not being too safe? That we're being ambitious, but not being too ambitious. That is just something we have to measure all the time. We have to challenge ourselves, but we have to be conscious of what production realities are and making sure that we are respecting people's time. Every decision I make, I am asking how is it going to affect the player, but also how is it going to affect my team? Mm -hmm. It's a balancing act. Relying on our, own, on our experience from the past, we are always going to strive to do something that's bleeding edge but we need to be very conscious right. that we need to ship. So I think that I mean that I mean it's it's not all I mean I feel like this because they're a new studio they're addressing the concern well, right now. That's what I appreciate about this is very transparent, very honest and in a kind of a weird way it's almost kind of like giving a middle finger to the big guys saying like this can be done right but you guys need to stop you got to be realistic right you can't just expect like great things to come out in six months either you you got it like you know because the problem with the industry is clearly everything wants to be mobile live services as well too but 
people like EA, and this has always been like an EA thing. They they want it now. We want to see our yeah. profits. Like if we don't see record profits or we don't see X amount of number, then it's a fucking it's a, it's a disaster, right? You know, right. that's the problem with the industry is it's gotten so out of control with like the reality of the situation. Instead of just being, you should it should be an industry that's less about making the money and just always moving forward or platforming sure. the, the industry, you know, as, as a medium. So, and, and I, that's why I really like that. And the guys involved, like, listen, when you said respawn instantly, I'm like, Titanfall three, <laughs> right? No, but yeah, you know, yeah. so, so at the end of the day, like, sounds like some good people. Single I mean, player, Stig something awesome. that he's a great director. Right. Let, let, you know, Hey, let's, let's watch that with a uh, great interest. Let the man cook. And, yeah. you know, and, and, and he has yeah. an understanding. Like, look, I don't need to hide. And it's kind of similar to what the, the, stu- the CEO for Arrowhead said the other day. He's like, look, yeah, there's a lot of interest in our game right now. And we could hire a bunch of people. But at the same time, we don't want to get over zealous on that because then we have to lay people off. Right. So, like, let's work with what we got now, mm-hmm. keep expectations in check, and make it fucking fun before anything. Right. Because, and it's not just the video game industry, it's it's the it's tech industry in general, like, seeing the fallout from after the pandemic and, like, different things, yeah. and like, trying to, like, make up, you know, for lost time during then or whatever it is, and that's why you see a lot of these sort of things happen so yeah you got to be real about it and i'm glad to see him saying that out loud because i feel like a lot of the bigs they're just trying to fucking submiss it and just kind of like spin it other ways yeah. when this is the, the gravity of the situation and obviously this is an independent studio right now but he hasn't ruled out the whole uh you know working with another publisher or like a big time publisher like xbox or, or playstation or nintendo right. with their Those- title you know and, and, and i mean they're, they're you're never going to meet a studio that's not going to listen to one of these publishers because you do get publisher dollars behind you and you get a little bit more assistance with your game. You get some more support. You get the help of those publishers. But like the thing I know about Stig and the games that he's made is he's made, he has an incredible vision and he knows how to make games that are a lot of fucking fun, immersive and, and, and memorable. Mm -hmm. And if he, you know, if I'm sure he would love to just do this as an independent studio, but I also think he understands like, look, this is not going to be cheap. Mm-hmm. And sometimes you do have to make deals with publishers to get that yeah, financial yeah, back and to make that vision happen. But at the same time, he understands that we also have to be responsible. Yeah. We can't be careless, go over budget, go big, because it is difficult to sell a AAA title if there's any kind of like risk involved. There's, if you're trying to do anything that's too different to what's popular, you lose a lot of people. Mm-hmm. That's unfortunate. That's just the way... Uh, we are nowadays. It's just the way we intake everything. Yeah, exactly. You know, cuddles. So. so I'll be curious to see what Giant Skull does. Obviously, yeah. a very talented team, a lot of talented people involved. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'll be excited to see what kind of game they come up with. But I do like that transparency that he kind of addressed what the elephant in the room in the game industry right now, which is like the the insane costs and the, that it takes to make these games mm-hmm. and how hard it is to make your money back to even justify keeping your fucking studio open. Yeah, crazy. So. Appreciate that input from Stig. Uh, 